Marvin Gaye's 1971 album, What's Going On, was not only a career-defining record for the artist, but an era-defining record also. At the end of the 1960s, Gaye was in the midst of a depression following the failure of his marriage to Anna Gordy, sister of Motown boss Berry Gordy. Things got worse with the death of his singing partner, Tammy Terrell, along with his growing addiction to cocaine and ongoing tax issues. Things came to a head when Berry Gordy's father actually stopped him from suicide in his Detroit apartment. Emerging from this, Gay found inspiration in feeling the need to respond artistically to the increased political unrest in the world at that time. He said, In 1969, I began to reevaluate my whole concept of what I wanted to say with my music. I was very much affected by letters my brother was sending from Vietnam, as well as the social situation here at home. I realized that I had to put my own fantasies behind me if I wanted to write songs that would reach the souls of people. I wanted them to take a look at what was happening in the world. Another Motown artist that was affected by these issues was Obie Benson, as while traveling on his tour bus with the Four Tops on May 15, 1969, he witnessed an act of police brutality and violence committed on anti-war protesters who had been protesting at Berkeley's People's Park in what was later known as Bloody Thursday. It inspired him to start writing a song about what he had witnessed. A game of golf with Obie Benson and Al Cleveland proved to be fateful, with the pair playing Marvin the unfinished song back at his house. After hearing it, Gay came up with the title and added more lyrics, whilst also embellishing the melody on his piano. He thought What's Going On would be an ideal song for the originals, whose hit Baby I'm For Real and The Bells he had co-written and produced. Benson convinced him otherwise, and so on June 10th, 1970, Marvin Gaye entered Studio A at Motown's Hitsville, USA to record the song himself. Studio A, also known as the Snake Pit, due to all the cables snaking around the room, had Chief Engineer Mike McLean's home-built five-channel tube line amplifier, into which musicians could plug a guitar or bass. This went to a balanced patch bay, and from there into the tape machine, which was a two-inch Ampex MM1016 track. The reason the electric guitars and bass guitars were DI'd in this way, instead of using amplifiers, was all down to separation. Barry Gordy wanted to minimize the amount of bleed between instruments, and would often record the bands live, including pianos, percussion, and singers. This practical move also shaped the nature of the sound, with the instrument sounding very defined and upfront. The famous Motown EQ units were still in use at this time, along with Pultex, and the addition of Yuri compressors in the form of LA-2As and 1176s. It was Steve Smith that was in charge for the initial rhythm section recordings for the song and the resulting album, and he recalls Chet Forrest drumming in the rear left corner of the Studio A live area. Marvin Gaye playing piano would have been in the near left corner, and to his right would have been Robert White on guitar. James Jameson normally played his bass standing in front of the DI, but in this case, his positioning was a little different. The story goes that Marvin was intent on having Jameson play on the record, even though he was nowhere to be seen. He was eventually tracked down, playing in a dive bar club somewhere in town, and was considerably worse for wear after enjoying the musician's privileges at the bar. Bringing him back to the studio, he was keen to play for his good friend Marvin, but completely unable to balance on his stool. So instead, after having one look at the song's music chart, lay on the floor, bass in hand, and proceeded to play an incredible bass line that is an integral part of the song's charm. I previously made a video on how to achieve Jameson's tone that you can find on this channel, but here's a quick rundown of the key aspects. So here are the plugins I use. The Plugin Alliance HG Black Box gave me that tube breakup saturation I could hear in the recording. Just a smidge of some Pultec EQ and fairly heavy compression using the CLA 76. It seemed to get me close enough where I was happy. The method for recording drums at the time was using an RCA DX77 on the kick drum, which is a surprising choice given that it's a sensitive ribbon mic. A U67 on the snare and also for overheads. Gay also added a box drum overdub which was literally a cardboard box. Guitarist Robert White played both a Gibson 335 and an L5. The tone of the recording suggested it was an L5, but I can't be sure. For reverb, they had the chambers that were located in the attic of the house that the studio was situated in. This setup consisted of mid and high range drivers up there, with Shure SM57s picking up the reverberated sound. This setup accentuated the mid and high end and was a huge part of the Motown sound. Universal Audio offer a plugin emulating this chamber. Here's a quick listen to what it can do. Mother, mother, 
There's too many of you crying, mother, mother. There's too many of you crying. Other musicians that contributed to the instrumental recording were percussionist Jack Ashford and Eddie Bongo Brain. And rather unusually, Gay's friends from the Detroit Lions contributed to the party like sounds that you can hear on the track, along with the Funk Brothers. The alto sax was played by Ellie Fontaine, but the prominent intro part wasn't actually planned. Ellie was just warming up and getting used to the song when he played the part. When Gay said that he loved it, Ellie replied that he was just goofing about. Gay said, Well, you goofed about exquisitely. Once the backing tracks were recorded, they moved on to Golden World Studios, or Motown Studio B, as it was known, to record the strings, horns, lead, and background vocals. The Norman U87 was used for the lead vocal or should I say lead vocals, plural, as there are actually two overlapping lead vocals on the record, although it wasn't actually intended. Ken Sands explains, We recorded two lead vocals that Marvin wanted to compare with one another when we were incorporating it into the track. He wanted me to make him two copies that could be played individually, but instead of doing that, I made one stereo mix with the entire track in the centre of the mix, the first vocal on the left-hand side and the second vocal on the right, just to save time so he could listen to them simultaneously or against each other. As it turned out, singing against himself worked. That's how a lot of things happen. A lot of brilliance is bred out of happy accidents. So the song was ready for release, but Barry Gordy wasn't impressed, denouncing what's going on as too jazzy, after Gay presented it to him with the religiously tinged B-side God is Love. The Motown boss refused to issue the single. The popular belief that Gay's political statements might have alienated certain listeners can't have been Gordy's primary concern. As earlier in 1970, he had released Edwin Starr's War and The Temptations' Ball of Confusion. He just didn't like what's going on, saying that it sounded old and that he hated its Dizzy Gillespie-style scats. Despite the standoff, Gay persuaded Motown to press 100,000 copies of the record without Gordy's consent. It sold out in just two days, leading them to press another 100,000 immediately to meet demands. This made it Motown's fastest-selling single to date, Gordy was happy to be proved wrong and asked Gay to go back to the studio to complete an accompanying album. He returned to Hitsville to record the rest of What's Going On, which took a mere 10 business days between March the 1st and March the 10th. The theme of social discontent continued, with songs such as What's Happening Brother, which came directly from a conversation between Marvin and his younger brother Frankie, who had been to Vietnam for a three and a half year tour of duty. When he returned, society didn't see him as a war hero and he struggled to find a job. Mercy, Mercy Me, The Ecology, became the second single release from the album and is an anthem of despair regarding humanity's treatment of the environment. The recording again uses the multi-track vocals and a sax solo by Wild Bill Moore. The distinctive percussive sound you can hear on the track was a wooden block struck by a rubber mallet drenched in reverb. The B-side of the single, Sad Tomorrows, was the early version of Flying High that features on the album also. Inner City Blues, Make Me Wanna Holler, is a great sounding laid back funk track that features bassist Bob Babbitt and the Detroit Symphony Orchestra, who also appear on many of the album's songs. With Save the Children, Gay's soaring falsetto of Flying High gives way to a more preacher like tone with spoken word verses used alongside the song lyrics. The rhythm section and other parts were tracked at Studio A, Detroit's United Sound Studios, and the Sound Factory Studio in West Hollywood. Completed in May 1971 and released the same month, What's Going On was the first of Marvin Gaye's albums to afford him credit as a sole producer. Steve Smith did a couple of mixes, and I did the final one, Sands recalls, contradicting the conventional wisdom that after he arrived in LA for a film project, Gaye scrapped the Detroit mix and remixed the album to give it an even softer, smoother feel. It was my mix that I heard on the radio, Sands insists, and that was my final assignment for Motown before the company relocated to the West Coast. The album What's Going On sat on the Billboard Top 200 for over a year, selling more than 2 million copies, whilst being named Album of the Year by Rolling Stone. In Rolling Stone's current list of the 500 greatest albums of all time, What's Going On sits there at number one. <laughs> 